Good evening, Apostle Carrie. Good evening. Good evening. Father, glory to God, hallelujah, thank you, 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 Father, glory to God, hall
Start at seven on the nose. Father, we just thank you and we glorify you. We give you honor and praise. Lord, we pray tonight as we come before you, Lord, to learn of you, to draw close to you, to learn of your ways. Father, I pray tonight, hallelujah, that God, this will draw us into a more intimate relationship. God, it will cause our discernment and our ears to be sharper, to be able to hear your voice with clarity, to know your word. And Father, we will respond to you. So Father, open the eyes of our understanding tonight. Give us revelation knowledge tonight, Lord. And Father, be glorified in us and through us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. So guys, good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the training. What I want to do tonight is I want to briefly go over um, this last chapter. And, um, and then we have two video clips that I need you to see. Uh, just talking about the nature of the Word of God and the clarity of the Word of God. <clears throat> And so we're going to um, we're going to listen to to those, um, and then what I want to do is I want to walk us through um, briefly this this study book to make sure we um, understand clearly. And if there is any questions. Um, I just want to make sure that um, whatever questions you have will be answered because tonight will be the last um, class for this training. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, good evening to those who are coming in again tonight. I'm going to briefly go over chapter eight and nine, and then we're going to listen to two videos. And then I'm going to uh, walk you through um, some of the main points that you should have pulled out. And um, I'm going to open it up as we go through that to see if um, you have any questions or um, just to make sure that you understand um, that you're taking clarity, you know, a clear, you're walking away with clarity tonight um, about all the things that we learned. And if there's any questions that I can answer um, during those times when we hit those points, it'll be this will be this open discussion to where, you know, as we go past the points, like, did you understand this? Did you get this? And if, when we get to those places, uh, then you could ask questions in regards to when we get to those points. All right. Um, but 
let's try to stay on topic. I'm going to try to go through everything from the beginning to the end. Um, so let's try to stay on topic with the questions, like as we go through. And I'll try. And if by the time we get to the end, if I didn't answer any of your questions, then ask it. But hopefully, hopefully we'll get through everything. All right. So come on in. Welcome everyone. Welcome. If you go to um, chapter eight, we're gonna. Um, it's talking about those false prophets, right? Um, and. It talks about how there are two types of false prophet. And the first type is comprised of people who have invited a spirit of divination into their lives. And the gift which enables somebody need to be on um, mute. Got a lot of feedback. The gift which enables them to prophesy comes from an evil spirit that has nothing to do with God. And the gift is from hell. And these people have let their hearts turn to evil. It is important to note here that although a word is coming from a spirit of divination, it can be accurate. It can be accurate. And it talks about in how Acts chapter 6, how the slave girl was following behind uh, Paul and she was crying out saying, these are the men of the most high God. These are the men of the most high God. And the truth is they were the men of the most high God, but she just had the wrong spirit. Um, and so... Sometimes the word can be right, but the source of where they draw it from can be wrong. And sometimes the word can be right, but their heart and their motives can be wrong. So, um, so it talks about one of the key things that we want to understand that when it start talking about false prophets, it's really just asking you to look at the heart of, the, of that prophet. Um, Cause you're going to see it's drawn a lot to look at the heart. Um, and you, from the heart, you're going to be able to really to tell by the fruit that they bear. Like, you're going to tell the fruit that they bear. Um, and so, a lot of times when you see people who um, who they're giving you a word from um, from an evil place, uh, they can, they'll draw their information um, and they may say different positive things about you, which may all be true. Um but it doesn't point back to God. It may point to other sources. It may point to um, palm reading or um, sun worship or draw. It was one uh, young lady and she was just talking, oh, she got so much peace. But she draw her peace from um, these practitioners who are, they do that rockna. I think it's called rockne or rockna. Um, it's some type of practice where they draw and they draw their source from within and they draw their source from this and that. And so again, um, it's talking about how a psychic, a psychic is an example of this type of false prophet. Sometimes psychics can be very accurate with their predictions, but they are not receiving their information from God. And when, some, when someone gives a true prophetic word, it is being released and carried by the power of God. When we operate in the gift of the spirit, we are working in agreement with the angels of God. And however, when a psychic or medium receives prediction, this information is being delivered and ultimately fulfilled by the demon spirits. A psychic, a medium, a fortune teller is operating out of the wrong heart in the evil spirit. Um, so they will be one classification of a false prophet. The second type of false prophet that he talks about in this book is the group of people who receive a call on their lives to a prophet as a prophet or a prophetess from birth or after they have received Christ, but they fall away from God. So um, he talks about how in the Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, Paul states that the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable, which means irrevocable, which means that once you got a call on your life, even if you ain't serving God, nobody can take that call away. Right, it's something that God has given you, something that God has called you to, and it just don't go away. So that's why you can see a lot of anointed people, um, or a lot of people that's got a call on their life, and you can see those gifts. They in the bars, they on the streets, they on the street corners, they, you know, what I'm saying, they in the graveyards, they they're everywhere. Um, and you'd be like, man, what a beautiful gift this person got. Man, that person is really talented. Man, you know, um, and 
And sometimes they just take their gifts and they serve other they serve other purposes. They you know, they live a worldly life or they they use it um and one of the one of the things you'll see real relevant in this day is you'll see a lot of musicians, anointed skillful musicians, and they split their talent. They'll play for the church and then they'll go play for bars. They'll go play in in bands and in clubs and you know, so you may see them split their gift um and you'd be like man these people are so anointed you know <laughs> these like but you know god don't snatch his gift away because we choose to use it the wrong way um now do it come back and bite the church a lot yeah because then we got to hear about how we false prophets and false preachers and false um so he talks about that second group which is a false prophet which is a person who has been either called by god as a prophet or during a Christian have received their call, you know, after becoming a Christian, and then they fall away and begin to operate uh, and use their gifts in other ways and operate in other ways, right? Um, it's a, however, these gifts would no longer be under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but will be turned over to the hands of the evil one. And we've seen that too um, in Saul. Remember, Saul was anointed king, but remember um, the anointing left Saul. And he was still king, but the the power of God was gone. <laughs> he was still king. And um, so you can see people still, you know, falling away from the church. And you can still see people operating, um, but they operating out of the wrong spirit, right? They're operating out of the wrong heart or the wrong spirit. So that would be another classification of a false prophet. Then he goes to give some of the characteristics of the prophet. Matthew 7, 15. Um, Florence, we're on page 94. Some of the characteristics of false prophets. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravious, ravious, ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. You need to underline that. Again, it's saying you will know these people by the fruit that they bear, okay? It goes on to say the grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. So it's giving you these comparisons to basically a very logical uh, comparison that we can kind of look at that in the natural and be like, you know, do you see these things <laughs> coming off of a tree, right? A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Then he goes on to say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of the Father, underline that. He, but he who does the will of the Father, of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Now I want you to underline that word lawlessness. Therefore, anyone who hears the word, these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and his house, uh, winds blew and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Glory to God. Everyone who bears these words of mine and does not act on them would be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. So it's talking about the characteristics of the false prophets. And then as we go on, he talks about how these are, this is how you can identify them, uh, the false prophets. He said, one, they may appear to be good like sheep, 
but are really wolves. So one of the things it speak to is um, that help us to be able to identify is like every person that you see dressed up <laughs> with the cloak of a prophet, every person that you see clothed with a clergy robe or clergy collar, you know, he's saying they look like sheep, right? But they're really wolves. So this one talks about basically they can have the appearance. And so this is why it's really important on being able to discern uh, and not only discern, but to be able to judge by the fruit that they bear. We're looking for fruit at this point. So we're discerning and we're looking for fruit because he said they are really wolves. And you might not be able to see them because of how they dress, how they present themselves. Right? He said they are the enemy of the sheep. The bad fruit that they bear is not a false gift, but an evil heart. Now here's something again that we listen to because he's saying they can be accurate <laughs> they can be accurate but their heart can be evil they can have an evil heart how many people do we know that can be right among us and they be preaching this 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 but they got a wicked heart evil heart. He said, remember these people will say to Jesus, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? But he will say to them, I never knew you. So on Sunday, we talked about the prophetic ministry and a big part of the prophetic ministry was an intimate relationship. We talked about on Sunday at church, I talked about having a re an intimate relationship. And I really want to get into covenant relationships because a part of the prophetic is being able to know God, uh, being able to have a relationship with him. You can't represent me if you don't know me. So you can say you know me, you know, um, you may hear me on the thing, but if you don't spend time with me, you really don't know me all the way. You may know some things about me. You may be familiar with things about me, but you don't really know me. So he talks about, um, I never knew you. I never knew you. He calls them lawless. And it said, it's interesting. Jesus defined lawless in Matthew chapter seven in the description of two different men building houses. He considered the one who heard his word, but did not act on them to be lawless. So to hear and not respond, lawless. To hear and not do, lawless. And so we talked about that. I think that came up in Journey Through the Word last night. Like, you got to read. And that's the song, too, we was playing. Like, you speak your word. Your word is truth. We will respond to you. Yes, we will respond to you. So response is everything, guys. He said, I never knew you. And he identifies them by lawlessness. You hear the word, but you do not act on them. Lawless. Notice also that the Lord equates knowing him with keeping his word. So if you know me, you'll obey me. If you know me, you'll do, you'll do what I command. So the inability to teach or instruct a false prophet is the fruit of lawlessness. And one of the things you'll see in one of the characteristics of a false, they talk about false prophets is sometimes they're unteachable. They Sometimes they think they know everything. Uh, they don't feel like they have to sit under no type of authority. And so sometimes uh, you can see that too. It says, it doesn't matter if these people are able to perform signs, wonders, and miracles. Their true fruit is revealed in whether or not they know and obey God. Please underline that. Their true fruit is revealed in whether or not they know and obey God. And sometimes we, people can get so caught up into, oh my God, they prophesied, oh my God, he told me so-and-so, oh my God, the prophets in town, girl, everybody was shouting, everybody was swinging, everybody was this, he laid hands, people was healed, people was miracle, and nobody is watching the fruit. Nobody's watching to see do we obey God? And so, you know, sometimes you can follow some of these, the character of some of these people and you, 
and you'll see them across the news and you'll see them doing all these different things on TV and then we'd be so shocked like, oh my God. And so he again saying, you know me, obey me. Okay. He said, if you love me, John 14, 15, you will keep my commandments. Number two, false prophets have their belief system founded on a few pet scriptures, which they consider the saying, building on saying, and not the whole counsel of God, which they consider the rock. False prophets take certain scriptures out of context that advocate their own agenda. They find scriptures, pull them out of a storyline, a story or an ideal, and create new doctrine. False prophets have power. Unfortunately, their goal is to use their influence to lead people to themselves and instead of to Christ. And this one is kind of a deep one because um, a false prophet makes his or herself the answer in place of God. So a lot of times when um, you see people who will make the church reliant on them, like they're not teaching them to have a relationship with God. They're not teaching them to not point to Jesus, but it makes the people all rely on them as they are the only one to hear from God. They are the only one with a prophetic word. They are the only ones, you know, who God called. Um, and again, it says it makes them think they are people's direct line to God. That is a scary one. Um, and it says, sometimes this perspective is the result of immaturity or misunderstanding of what prophetic ministry really is. However, if they exhibit the other signs we have been re reviewing and intentionally present their prophetic voices at the exclusive way to hear from God, they are treading on dangerous ground. Some people have a desire to be needed so badly that they lead people to themselves through their ministry instead of leading them to Christ. And that's one of the things in our ministry uh, at the bridge, we try to make sure all outreach ministry or all ministry is pointing back to Christ. Um, I don't care what you're doing, whether uh, we handing out food, clothing, uh, helping somebody, everything need to be pointed back to Christ um, to where, because if you don't be careful, people you start moving into prophetic gifts and people will make you their gods. Okay. As soon as they have a problem, they always want to call you. They always want to hear what you got to say. They always want to hear you. They always want you to pray. They always want you to, they always want you. They always, and it's, and it's like, we're not teaching them that they need to have a personal relationship with Christ, that they can reach Christ. Christ hear them just like he hears us. Um, and so uh, he's no respecter of person. But when we make them feel like that, then they make us a God, you know. Um, so we always tell people, don't let nobody make you Jesus. Um, point them back to Christ. I'm not your savior. <laughs> I'm not your savior. Um, so it's important for us to be aware of this reality. And it's easy for people to assume that signs, wonders, and, and the demonstration of power confirm and validate certain people um, as authentic prophets. It don't. Okay, so again, to talk about discerning, how we need to be very discerning and but the difference between a true and a false prophet. He talks about how um, in the first book of first John, the apostle gives us keys about discerning spirit. He warns the Christians not to become false prophets by believing in the wrong spirit. <laughs> so that is just it. <laughs> We're talking about the heart of the matter. We're talking about the wrong spirit. Uh, so we really have to be discerning because um, it's talking about how many Christians do not believe that evil spirits can influence them. Uh, and that's one of the greatest deceptions in the church today is the idea that Christians cannot be deceived by the devil. Um, and then it tells us here in 1 John, he kind of dispels the myth. 1 John 4, 1 and 3, he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. 
So again, he tells us there, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits. <laughs> that with an S, plural. Um, he gives five tests of a true prophet. Does the prophet believe in the redemptive work of the Son of God? Um, and I love that because in there, he said the word Christ is the Greek word Christos. Christos, and it means the anointed one, Christos. Uh, the anointing is always related to the power of God. Beware of people who try to tell you that Jesus don't do miracles anymore. This is dangerous because the scripture tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, um, and forever. Uh, look at number two. False prophets do not like to listen to anyone. They believe that God tells them everything. And this, again, goes back to the point where um, they don't really teach you how to be in relationship with Christ. They make themselves to God as if they are the only ones holy. They are the only ones to hear from God. They are the only one with gifts. And they really don't allow giftings in their church. Um, so false prophets can be hyper-spiritual. They uh, begin most of their statements with the Lord said to me or God told me. And, and basically he's saying just to beware here because a lot of times, you know, they can make it as seem as if they hear from God, but you don't. Um, but he was saying the truth is if we are really submitted to God, then it must manifest in submission. And I love that. If we are really submitted to God, then it must manifest in submission to real spiritual authority. So if we claim to follow Jesus, but do not follow the leaders he has put in authority in our lives, then we are deceiving ourselves. So it really just goes to um, every prophetic person pretty much needs to submit to some type of authority. And it's saying if you can't submit to authority, then that's the wrong spirit to have because you're not a self-governing, self-ruling spirit. So he said, when we resist authority, we rob ourselves of an opportunity for spiritual growth, which ultimately hinders the effectiveness that the Holy Spirit wants to release through our lives. And then he, he says, dear beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love does not know God for God is love. So... Uh, by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And that's so, so powerful. It's saying one of the um, keys of prophetic ministry is rooted in love. All ministry is rooted in love. Um, but he goes here and so, um, and he says that it is, he is the love of God is manifested in us. It is manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So we live through Christ and you need to catch that we live through Christ. The love of God is manifested through us. <laughs> it is, and so everything is rooted in love. It's rooted in grace. It's rooted in mercy. Um, so again, false prophets view correction as persecution. Um, and I hope you guys got a chance to read all that because I didn't want to cover all of this like word from word, but it talks about how the, um, sometimes, you know, false prophets don't like persecution. They, they'll, um, say that correction is persecution. Like when they get corrected, oh, I'm being persecuted. Um, and it's like, no, you're not being persecuted. You're being corrected. Um, and he, Paul talks about here how the spirit of prophets are subject to the prophets, right? So in other words, um, real prophets are willing to receive correction, whether they are delivering a message in tongues or sharing a prophetic word. So that's, again, being submissive. Um, and again, you have to be careful too, because a lot of times when people operate in the prophetic, sometimes as God increased their gift, people can get arrogant and bold because um, they feel like, oh, God, show me all this. I'm deep. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm praying. I'm, you know, you seeing healings manifested and then people can get arrogant, right? 
And then you start seeing people use it in all type of ways. Like, um, you see, you see them using it in ways to, you know, fifty dollar, um, fifty dollar lines, hundred dollars, you know, five hundred dollars for a prayer. <laughs> I'm laying hands, you know. Ten people give a thousand dollars, and those are the people I'm gonna prophesy to. So then you start seeing people use it in all different type of ways that um, that can just not be of God. All right. Um, number three, false prophets are not motivated motivated by love, but are motivated by a need to be noticed. So again, we go back to the central theme of all ministries must be the love of God. We must ask ourselves, am I in the ministry for the purpose of bringing out the best in people? Or do I have the kind of love that covers a multitude of sins? And that's what we I'm talking about. Like that love that we're talking about that must be the central uh, theme, the love of God. It needs to be love that covers a multitude of sins. And it, it goes to say in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us us like he we love because he first loved us now if you can just remember how how messed up you might have been <laughs> and you can just remember how messed up you might have been and just think about how love found you and then it says and that's the love that we want to give he loved me when I was unlovable because he loved me we love him because he first loved me. And he said, anyone who says, I, you know, I, I love God but hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the love, the one who loves God should love his brother also. Guys, this is so, it's basic foundation stuff, but it's so... It's principles that's lacking because, again, you can see people who operate in the prophetic but don't speak to family members. You can see people who deep in tongues and don't speak and don't. It's hard with forgiving and um, and so these are things that, if we struggle in these areas, that these are areas that we have to submit to God. And we have to pray for the Lord to help us in these areas because we want to bear the fruit um, of love. We want to bear the fruit of mercy, uh, grace. Number four, false prophets commonly use fear to motivate people. And this is the one where they, we again, we talked about being careful of how you prophesy. You're not prophesying out of the old covenant. You're not prophesying doom and gloom over people. Um, and so it said, love is the central theme of the gospel. Anyone operating the prophetic ministry who is defined, who uh, in the prophetic ministry who isn't defined by love has missed the entire point of the gospel. We will make mistakes. We will mess up. We'll even fail at times. But when love is at the core of our ministry, it always expressed in kindness, gentleness, and humility. So guys, we, I don't know if you've seen the video when he talked about you know, just because you may get a, a prophecy wrong, we know in part, we prophesy in part, that don't classify you as a false prophet. Again, we're talking about drawing from the wrong spirit, the wrong source. We're talking about having an evil spirit and a wicked heart. Okay? Um, false prophets are not in covenant relationship with the body of Christ. And again, this is... Um, you can observe false prophets who has who has a healthy relationship with a local church they attend. As a matter of fact, many do not even attend the church at all. They wander from place to place looking for people who would listen to them. Often their goal is to gain a following, stealing people from the flock. And false prophets often use a combination of power and flattery to attract a following. And because false prophets are not in covenant relationships with the body of Christ, they recruit others out of the church community to join them in their independent, distorted spiritual journey. Um, and so sometimes you can see people where they just be like, oh, oh, I, I, you know, I got my relationship with God. I, I worship, you know, I read the word. I, I, I pray every day. <laughs> 
but you're not in fellowship. <laughs> you're not submitting to some type of authority. No, God called me to, you know, and so you hear those type of things, which is red flags to where um, you can't submit to authority. So the word covenant means that we are in, we are not in a relationship for what we can get from people, but rather for what we can give. So covenant relationships are costly. And John 15, 13 said, Greater love has no one than this than one laid on his life for a friend. So um, I have had some very healthy relationships with um, prophets um, who, you know, when they use their spiritual gift in my house, um, they're asking for, um, can they speak? Can they share something? Um, or they'll reveal to me what God revealed to them about the church or a word. I got a word for your church. Well, if you got a word for my church, you can share it with me first and let me determine. Um, and so I've had them come to me and talk with me and then we'll, sh we'll share. Oh yeah, we definitely got to share that word. Um, and uh, so we, you know, again, this whole thing of submitting and doing things decent in order, um, you don't want to be so, your prophetic gift is so deep to where it can't submit to anybody. It's going to overrule everything. It's going to, it's going to be chaotic and uncontrollable. And you got a word for everybody and you're going to speak over everybody in skies. So when we start seeing um, that it's uncontrollable, <laughs> You know, uh, we using it for the wrong, uh, wrong ways. It's more about flattery and showcasing and shows, and we really have to be careful. Just and we just want like, Lord, teach me, teach me how to serve in the right spirit and out of the. I want to flow out of the right spirit and the right heart. Okay. Um. So it's talking about this last page, it's talking about leading people out of prophetic deception. Confronting those who believe they are true prophets but are not can be a rather difficult situation. Most false prophets have been abused by authority much of their lives and therefore do not trust anyone. Fear is the number one reason why people become a hyper-spiritual and it results in religious deception. And to make matters worse, many false prophets have a martyr's complex the more they are confronted about their uh, weirdness, they are the more validated they feel. They interpret attempts at correcting them as persecution that proves they are standing for God and against unrighteous religious systems. They say things like, I don't believe in organized religion. And when the real problem is they don't like boundaries. And remember, Jesus calls them lawless. Lawless people are those who want to live outside of authority. Um... And so they talk about how can they be helped. And it talks about really uh, learning how to correct people in love. And this is another thing that we got to get better at, too, is learning how to correct people in love. Um, it said all that wickedness needs to prosper is for the righteous men not to do anything, not to do nothing. So it's important to not react, but instead respond to these people. Otherwise, we cure. The cure can be worse than the disease. People like this are accustomed to criticism and rejection and will use it to validate their ministry. And I think me and Therese have had um, a wonderful opportunity um, through Journey Through the Word to, um, there's a lot of times where um, people have said things wrong or done things wrong. Um, and some we have been able to identify their spirit and like this person means well um we we can reach out to them and you know and share with them um you know the view that they're taking is wrong and then there's some just be like oh they're not teachable <laughs> they're not gonna be able to receive the word um so we'll have to pray on how to deal, deal with this one because this one will be more of an offense than a fight um, so we have to, even when we dealing with people and bringing correction, we, that's an area that we want to pray. Um, and, and again, get wisdom on Lord, how do I, how do I speak the truth to them in love? Um, how do I correct them in love? How do I win them over in love? Um, 
uh, some people don't like correction and some people do like correction. I, I can tell you correction do hurt sometimes, and but that's good. You know, that's where we grow. Godly discipline. Godly discipline is not punishment. Okay. Um, the difference between punishment and discipline is that punishment says I will get it even when uh, with you for the damage you have caused. But discipline says I love you too much to leave you broken. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> punishment says I will get even with you for the damage you have caused. But discipline says, I love you too much to leave you broken. I love that. I love you too much to leave you broken. So the only hope for these people is that they begin to feel loved. So again, let's hear this, that this is a key part of our prophetic ministry. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love. Let's, let's hear this real clear. Our ministry is rooted in love, the love of God, the grace of God. We are pointing people back to Christ. I love you too much to leave you broken. So it talks about when you deal with people who just refuse to repent, to submit to correction. It's just like, you know, it talks about, you know, move, removing them from fellowship. Uh, otherwise, they will lead others astray. I had one young lady who was a part of my ministry. She had came over from another ministry. And when she came, I knew she was in trouble because she had been under her ministry for 20-something years. But the pastor died. And the wife took over. But she couldn't get along with the wife. So she fought back and forth with the wife and she could not submit to the authority of the wife. And um, one of the things was she wanted to run around prophesying, laying hands on people during service and all these other different things that just was like, well, that's kind of out of order. Right. That's kind of out of order. So she left. The, she left their church and uh, she came over to our church and I just told her, you know, um, she was still grieving her pastor and his wife, the wife is not the pastor, you know what I'm saying? And you, you, you got to allow her the liberty to lead how God give her the lead. But if you're looking for your pastor in her, you're going to keep judging her. Right. So I told her she can come to the church and heal and just come fellowship with us till you heal and figure out what you want to do and where you want to go so you won't just be wandering out there you know with no covering and no family um and it was not even soon that you know you know i would be preaching and she get up she all all over the sanctuary while i'm preaching laying hands on people you know prophesying no, no wait 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 like you are subject <laughs> to the prophet of the house your gift is not that deep that it can't come under order of submission. Sit down, <laughs> like sit yourself down. Um, and then it was just like one thing after another and she had a very, um, very, I mean, she was powerful in her gift, but she had a very wicked little spirit. She fought with everybody, everybody. Everybody called the police, everywhere she went, somebody's called the police on her. And I'm like, I can't understand why everywhere you go is just drama. Like, um, and so, you know, but she couldn't receive correction. Everybody was always wrong. You couldn't correct her. I couldn't correct her. I could. And it was just like, look, maybe this ain't the place for you. Cause I, I just can't let you tear my house up, you know? So, you know, eventually I had to lead her on <laughs> another way because it's just like, maybe this ain't the place for you. And of course she bashed me. I'm a false prophet. I'm a false this. I'm a false that, that, and that. But it was just like the fruit that she was bearing was just like chaotic everywhere she went. So sometimes you may you may have to say, listen, this is not this ain't the ministry for you. I'm, you know, maybe, hey, you know, there's plenty of ministries for you to go. But obviously you can't submit to the authority of this ministry and, you know, to the flow of this ministry and you want to do your own thing. And so, you know, you got to be able to. 
either stir people in the right direction in love or and if they can't submit to correction you got to learn how to let people go right so anyways chapter nine just deal with practicing prophecy um and it just really um when you start talking about practicing prophecy it's just really talking about putting your um putting the gift in the fire and it says do not neglect first timothy 4 uh, 14 through 15 do not neglect the spiritual gift within you which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the land on the hands by the pro, um, Presbyterian take take pains with these things be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all and it's talking about really reaching beyond your comfort zone page 104 it's talking about only way you really going to grow in this prophetic is to practice it, right? Um, moving out of your comfort zone and really start practicing it. And it's talking about, so if you got this gift that God has given us, it's don't neglect it. <laughs> don't be like, I, I went to, to this class, I'm going to learn, and I'm not going to use it. I'm going to put it back on the shelf. Um and some out of fear that you might say the wrong thing you might do the wrong thing um but he's saying do not neglect it um paul in second timothy 1 6 reminds timothy to kindle afresh the gift of god and according to the greek this phrase can be translated put your gift in the fire the next verse makes it more more sense now in this context for god has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind so whenever we step out in faith we must step over fear fear is the guard dog that is protecting the fortress of spiritual prosperity so when the dog start barking we can be sure that the treasure he is guarding is near so most people do not allow their gifts to be forged in the fire of risk this results in gifts that are weak and not tempered okay so again, um, we're talking about stirring up these gifts now. You in this class, we stirring them up. Um, we all got this gift. This is not prof. This is not the not, this is not the office of the prophet. This is the gift of prophecy. Um, we all got this gift to um, to encourage. To speak, to hear what the Lord is saying, to speak what the Lord is saying, to encourage, to edify, to build up, to lift up. So we all have this gift. So he, um, so we see here where Paul is uh, telling Timothy, we're going to stir this gift up. We're going to stir the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. Uh, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, not fear. So we're going to. You're going to have to practice this. And so it gives us some suggestions on the next page. We're saying prophesy your day. Like when you wake up in the morning, ask the Lord for information about the day. Pray your day. Prophesy your day. Speak to your morning. Um, ask the Lord to give you revelation for the day. Um, a lot of times you get revelation early in the morning. Like I'm driving to work. I can get good revelation. I'm worshiping. I'm singing. I'm seeing stuff. A lot of times I'm at work, I get revelation. Um, ask the Lord to give you revelation. Practice word of knowledge. This one is just talking about maybe go to a restaurant or a public and, and pray for a person who is providing a service for you. Like, you know, move out in fear and be like, hey, you mind if we pray together? You mind if I we have a word of prayer? You mind if I share uh, something with you that the Lord is, is putting in my heart? Um, and... You know, and then it's talking about um, team up or team up with another person, a prayer partner. Um, I think Teresa's gift just set on fire because she started calling me in the morning prophesying like, I, Apostle, I ain't really good this yet, but I believe I hear the Lord saying. <laughs> and I'm like, come on and prophesy, girl, prophesy. And uh, and so she'll call me some mornings and be like, this is what I heard the Lord saying. Now, I don't know if it's right, but here's what I heard. And I think just recently it was a, um, I think it was a, not even, I don't know if she was a coworker 
but the, the word uh, Teresa was excited because she's like, I believe the Lord gave me a word of knowledge for somebody. And I was like, and she shared it with her. And the, the lady uh, ended up sharing with her how on point she was. Um, and I love the fact that she wasn't for sure if she was right or not, but she felt a strong impression that the Lord had put it in her heart. And she stepped out on faith and, and was like, I'm going to tell her. <laughs> and she did it. She stepped out on faith and she'd call me and be like, here's what I heard the Lord. And she's telling me what the Lord said and I'm shouting and screaming because it's what it's it's like the Lord was talking to me about something that I have been worrying about. And so she calls with this this word of knowledge and she's sharing me what the Lord is sharing with her. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because this is something that was on my heart. So, you know, a lot of times we think like we can be fearful um, to say it because we think we're going to be wrong. Right. And again, I point out sometimes you may be wrong. Sometimes you may. And not not necessarily, I don't even want to say sometimes necessarily always wrong, but sometimes things, just remember that the prophetic word can be, um, a prophetic word can be now. It can be something God is showing us in the future. It can be something that's coming. It can be something that we need to pray about, pray against. Um... So sometimes when God shows us these things, um, and they might be like, well, I, you know, I didn't see that. Or I didn't this. Okay, well, we're going to, you know what, we're going to pray. You know, how about we just, we, we'll pray and ask God for more revelation. You know, maybe this is something to come. And let's just pray. Let's just pray about it. So um, those are areas of prayer um, that we can pray about. Um, words of knowledge for healing. You can practice words of knowledge for healing in a group setting and basically just simply praying over illnesses and pain. And um, and we can we gonna we're gonna practice that on Therese tonight. Amen. <laughs> ah, glory! And anybody else that feel an ache in their body, we can we gonna speak a word, a word of the Lord, a word of healing tonight. All right. Um we're gonna pray that that person experience the joy and they receive the Lord's healing. It talk about prophesying as a group. It talk about prophetic intercession, um, praying in the spirit, and just just praying in the spirit, and then just hear what the Lord is saying. Like, and sometimes just laying in His presence, just like some not even worship music. So sometimes worship music got words, but maybe just put on some instrumental music, or maybe just lay in silence, or maybe pray, and then. Because a lot of times, guys, we pray and then we get up and we leave. And a lot of times I, I have what we call a prophetic soaking. And it's um, we pray and then we be quiet and we wait. And so then we labor for the Lord and see what the Lord say. So you pray for a while and then you just lay there and soak for a while. You just lay in the presence of the Lord or sit in the presence of the Lord. So a lot of times we pray and then we get up and we don't wait for a response. Sometimes we just pray, God, I'm gonna talk to you, but I ain't got time for you talking to me back. I gotta go, prayer is over. <laughs> we up, we going to work, <laughs> we going to sleep. But I'm gonna challenge you to pray and wait. Pray and then do a prophetic soaking to see what the Lord would say. And a lot of times if you do that, you'll pray or you labor for the Lord, and you'll need paper and pencil because a lot of times you start writing what you hear in the spirit. Okay. Um, real quick, I want to play these um, these two clips. They are not long, but one is going to be talking about. Ooh, Give me a second. It's coming on the screen. Amen. All right. Okay. All right. So one, I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about the, um, I 
I want to talk about the knowability of God. And then I want to talk about the, um, the authority of the scripture. Um, so it's kind of three of these that I want you to hear, but they like five to seven minutes apart. So get your ink pens out and let's get ready to listen. Let me know if you can hear. Hold on. We're going we're gonna to rebuke this thing. Every time we get ready to try to play a DVD, it just get the acting up. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. Hold on, y'all. There we go. Come on, Jesus. Come through, Father. Okay. There we go. Let me know if y'all can hear this. Hold on. What are the characteristics of the Bible? Thumbs up if you can like? hear it. We're going to talk in this session and the next several sessions about four characteristics of Scripture. It's authority, it's clarity, it's necessity, it's sufficiency. But in this session, we're focusing on the authority of Scripture. What does that mean? It means that all the words in the Bible, the words that we read in the Bible, are God's words. In this sense, if, if I disbelieve any word of Scripture, I'm, dis I'm disbelieving God himself. And if I read something that is commanded and, and directed to my situation in life, and I disobey it, I I'm disobeying God. Now that's remarkable authority. The authority of Scripture is the authority of God. Well, how, how do we conclude that? Well, we start out by saying uh, this about Scripture. We, we start out by saying, what, what, well, what does it claim for its own authority? What does it claim for itself? And this is uh, a good principle when we're considering any book of literature. If I have a book and it says History of the State of Arizona, and I open it up, I expect to see the History of the State of Arizona. That's what it claims to be. If I open it up and it's a list of practical jokes, I'm saying, well, this book is it's a bogus. It's, a, it's a lying to me or deceiving me. Generally, the first thing to think about in literature is what does a book claim for itself? And so we want to look first, whether, whether people believe this or not, just uh, in an impartial way, say, what is the Bible claiming for itself? And what we find is many, many times the Bible claims to be the Word of God. We have hundreds of times in the Old Testament where the prophets say, thus says the Lord, and then they give the very words of God. And then we find that God is speaking through these prophets. And in the New Testament, a number of passages indicate that the New Testament authors thought the Old Testament writings to be God's very words. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for us in various ways. So the New Testament authors thought the Old Testament was the Word of God, and then um, in New Testament passages, there are many sections of the Old Testament that are referred to as God's words. There's a remarkable passage in uh, Matthew 19 where Jesus is talking to his opponents, and he said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? That's referring to the creation of Adam and Eve and said, so God made them, and said, this is God said, therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The interesting part about that quotation is that Jesus goes back into the Old Testament, and it's not a passage that says God said this, or thus says the Lord. It's just the narrator speaking and saying, therefore man shall leave his father and mother. It's at the end of uh, Genesis 2. And so Jesus can take any phrase from the Old Testament and say that God spoke it. He is viewing all of the Old Testament as the words of God. And then the New Testament authors in various places we, we will see in this session refer to uh, other New Testament writers as uh, speaking the very, or writing the very words of God. So uh, we go through in this session the claims of Scripture to be the Word of God, whether people believe it or not. But then quest the question is, how do people come to believe this? 
Well, we are convinced that it is the Word of God as we read it. Uh, we can investigate archaeological accuracy and find that the Bible is consistent with the findings of archaeology. We can investigate internal consistency and find that the Bible really doesn't contradict itself in any way. But there are other books that are archaeologically accurate or consistent and don't contradict themselves. That doesn't prove this to be the Word of God. Ultimately, our conviction that the Scripture is the Word of God is as we read it, these words speak to our minds and our hearts, and we say, this is unlike any other book I've ever read. This, in, in this book, I, I hear the voice of my Creator speaking to my heart. And that, that's what has happened uh, through, to hundreds of millions of Christians throughout history. The words of Scripture have come with power and persuaded us that they are not just true and not just reliable, but they are the very words of God. We talk in this, uh, chap in this chapter or this session about other claims of other people like Mormons, that the Book of Mormon proves itself to be God's words and how the scripture is far different from the Book of Mormon because it's accurate, it's historically truthful, and it doesn't uh, contradict itself and disprove itself to be the word of God. And there are other reasons. Now, the conclusion we get from that study of the authority of God's Word is, as I said at the beginning, if we don't believe something, we're not believing God if it's written in Scripture. And if we don't obey something in Scripture that applies to us today, then we're disobeying God. That has been a massively important concept in my entire lifetime. Once I, as a child, began to read the Word of God and came to believe that it was the very words of God, I had from childhood and on through my adult life now, this deep sense that I never want to disbelieve or consciously, willfully disobey anything that God says to me in Scripture. It's all His Word. It's all truthful. It's all accurate. It's all authoritative. And I am obligated before God to obey all of it. And He, on the last day, will hold me accountable for whether I have obeyed it or not, whether I have believed it or not. Not that our salvation depends on perfect obedience. I don't want to say that, and we'll get to that in the later sessions. But I do think that 2 Corinthians 5 says, for instance, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. That is, uh, our rewards in, uh, in the life to come are dependent upon our faithfulness in believing everything that's in Scripture and being obedient to it as we best understand it. Uh, and I think that um, our relationship with God and God's favor on our life also is affected by whether we believe it and obey it. So it's massively important. It has been in my life, and I hope it will be in yours as well, this idea of the authority of Scripture. There's another characteristic that we could mention in the authority of Scripture, and that is the power of Scripture. Since it's the Word of God, um, the Bible itself can say it's, it's like the rain that comes from heaven and doesn't return to heaven. It accomplishes what God pleases. And uh, it's like a sharp two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so that power of Scripture, if we take time each day to read it, we'll find again and again that it is speaking to us, it is getting inside of us, it is mm -hmm. changing us because it has the power of God working through. Finally, the authority of Scripture has strong implications for the truthfulness of Scripture. Since these are God's words as well as human words, and since God is a God who cannot lie, according to uh, the book of Hebrews or Titus 1-2, he's the unlying God, the God who never lies. Therefore, all the words of Scripture are completely truthful and without error in any part. And uh, we shouldn't ever worry that some new historical fact or archaeological fact will arise to contradict the Bible. God knows all those facts in advance. And um, he's written his word in such a way that it's completely truthful. He's caused his word to be written by human authors in such a way that it's completely truthful and reliable. The authority of Scripture is the authority of God, and we should receive it believe it and obey it in that sense. Amen.
Okay. Um, and I want to deal with the clarity of scripture. Have you ever heard people say that the Bible is confusing, that it's too hard to understand, that it's mysterious, that it doesn't make any sense? Well, they're really saying that God didn't do a good job of overseeing the production and the writing and the words of Scripture, that God hasn't communicated to us in a, in a way that's clear to us. But the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture that we'll deal with in this session uh, is contrary to that view. It affirms that God has spoken to us in a way that we, could, that we can understand. And so um, we could say that the scripture is written in such a way that it, its teachings are able to be understood by ordinary believers. We find that both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, um, listen to this in Deuteronomy 6. You shall teach these words, Moses says, you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. In other words, families, mothers and fathers were expected to teach these words, words of scripture to their children. That's ordinary Israelites. That isn't just the teachers, the priests, the uh, scholars in Israel, ordinary people. And Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 says the word of God makes wise the simple. That is people who find it hard to understand some things, who might not be as well trained or well educated, the word of God makes wise even the simple. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, we find that the New Testament authors uh, and Jesus himself have the same uh, expectation. Jesus never blames people's confusion on the obscurity of scripture, but always says things like, have you not read? Is it not written? Or to Nicodemus, are you a teacher of Israel and you do not understand this? In other words, Jesus puts the blame back on the people because they haven't read or studied or understand, mm -hmm. understood Scripture well enough, not blaming Scripture for being unclear. He doesn't mm -hmm. ever say something like, Oh, I understand why you have that problem. The teachings of the Word of God are uh, difficult to understand. They present unusual hermeneutical difficulties and problems and um, nobody can understand this. We don't get anything like that in Jesus or the New Testament authors. Rather, in one case, Jesus said, you are wrong because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And so Jesus puts the blame back on the hearers for not studying or adequately paying attention to the words of God. And the, and the New Testament epistles are written to whole churches, to the church of God in Corinth, to the churches of Galatia, etc. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to understand the Bible perfectly right off the bat on first reading. Uh, even the early church grew in its ability to understand Scripture, and we find uh, that uh, the disciples didn't understand the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus until Jesus was able to teach them, and then they understood them gradually and uh, more fully as time went on. So there's a process involved. We're not going to understand it perfectly without studying it. Uh, but it requires repeated attention and we grow in our ability over time to see how it all fits together and how its teachings uh, have uh, much more depth and internal consistency than we realize. Well, also, if people are unwilling to obey it, they're not going to understand scripture because there's a moral and spiritual ability that is necessary for people to understand scripture the unspiritual man, says Paul in 1 Corinthians, doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. They're spiritually discerned. And so people need to be born again. They need to be believers so that they can understand what God is saying. And then they need to have a willingness to receive and obey it because a hard-hearted resistance to it will not lead to correct understanding. I find that this doctrine of the clarity of Scripture is a tremendous encouragement. It means that uh, where there are areas of doctrinal or ethical disagreement among Christians, uh, either uh, one of us or the other of us has made a mistake in understanding Scripture, or it might be we're seeking to make affirmations where the Bible itself is silent and we're trying to say more than the Bible says. I remember once when I was in uh, doctoral work, a very good friend of mine 
and I disagreed on the question of whether infants should be baptized or people who made a profession of faith. And we argued about it, and we talked about it day after day. Finally, we, got, we decided not to talk about it anymore because we thought it was hurting our friendship to pursue the conversation further. But we both believed that one of us was making a mistake. I thought I knew who was making the mistake in his interpretation, but he thought it was me and I thought it was him. We didn't blame scripture for being unclear. I think also this truth should give great encouragement to all Christians. It means that we should eagerly read our Bibles daily, expecting that God will teach us from it. Uh, we can learn more from it the more we read and the more frequently and the uh, more often we read it, but something should come to our minds and hearts as we read it. As an elementary, a young elementary school child, I read my King James Version of the Bible and I was learning from it. I was excited about it. I found that God was speaking to me in it. Uh, and I could read something like the Gospel of John and uh, God's words worked in my heart and my mind. I can read the Gospel of John today and find much more depth of understanding, but I understood it at one level even as a child and that's the way scripture works with, uh, with all believers. It means also that um, it's, it's nice in a church when Christians are talking, they say, oh, I read this in this Christian book, or I heard this Christian speaker say this. But it's even more encouraging when a church is filled with conversations like, let me show you what I saw in 2 Corinthians 5 this morning. Because it means that people are looking at scripture and scripture is speaking to them individually and personally and they're understanding it. The doctrine of the clarity of scripture means that I think that should be happening. We should be able to make uh, new discoveries and learn new things from scripture um, each day as we read it. It also means that where we face uh, an ethical problem about what God wants us to do in a certain area, we should go to scripture eagerly believing that if there is something that God wants to uh, command to us or teach to us about moral standards, he said, it, he said it clearly in his, in his word. So the doctrine of the clarity of scripture, it, it has been of huge importance in my life. It led me to seek to write the book Systematic Theology in a way that communicated doctrine clearly to ordinary believers because I thought if God himself communicated clearly in his word, so our communication should, should seek to be clear mm -hmm. and not just confusing to the people we, we speak and write to. The doctrine of the clarity of scripture has also encouraged me to search into scripture to see if there was application to new areas that I hadn't studied before, areas of solutions to world poverty or teachings about civil government or teachings about marriage and other ethical questions because I was convinced that it was God's purpose to teach us in his word and if I pursued it and prayed and sought to be obedient to him he would teach me and enable me to discover what he said, uh, what he was saying to me in his word. But I don't think that's just for scholars. I think it's something that every Christian should have a confidence in. That this this is a book that that God caused to be written. He spoke His own words in, and He did so in such a way that it communicates clearly to us. And we should have great thanksgiving to God uh, for this doctrine of the clarity of Scripture. Okay, we got one more. Hayara Mandukusha. Glory to God. Glory to God. This session on the necessity of Scripture asks the question. For what things is the Bible necessary? And then, what can we know about God and his moral code apart from the Bible? For what things is the Bible not necessary? Well, we could summarize this by saying that the Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel, for maintaining spiritual life, and for certain knowledge of God's will. But it's not necessary for knowing that God exists or something about his moral laws. Let's start with that first part. The Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel. Paul says in Romans 10, 13 to 17, that 
people really need to hear about the preaching of Christ if they're going to know how to be saved. Let me read the passage. Paul says, How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? The implication is they can't. You can't call on someone you haven't believed in. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? You can't believe in someone that you've never heard of. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And then at the conclusion of the paragraph, Paul says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So Paul is saying that people can't believe on Christ unless they hear about him. And they hear about him through the preaching of the word, through someone telling them what the Bible says or actually through people reading the Bible themselves. That's why we say the Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel. It's necessary to have the words of God to understand that God has given us a way of salvation through his Son. Now, when I say the Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel, and therefore in order to be saved, people might say, well then, wait a minute, how could believers before Christ be saved, believers in the Old Testament times? The Bible says that believers in the Old Testament were saved by looking forward to the Messiah who was promised and who was to come and trusting in him. Um, Jesus says in John 8:56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham looked forward to Christ and trusted in him through the promises of the Old Testament. So people were trusting the Messiah who was to come, even though he had not yet come. But the question then comes up, could people be saved? Can people be saved today who do not have the words of the Bible? It does not seem likely. I want to be very careful in how I answer that question. I'm not saying that it's absolutely impossible that God would ever bring someone to salvation who hasn't had the words of the Bible or heard what the words of the Bible say. But it does seem to me the Bible doesn't encourage us to believe that people will be saved in that way because even in the Old Testament, the only firm foundation uh, for people to rest their faith on is the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God which tells uh, the Gospel in brief form in the predictions of the Old Testament and then the Word of God in the New Testament that tells more fully that Jesus has come. So the Bible is necessary for knowledge of the Gospel, for people to be saved. Next, the Bible is necessary for maintaining spiritual life. Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is, as we need physical food for our nourishment daily, Jesus is saying we live on the Word of God spiritually. It's necessary for our spiritual life. Then the Bible is necessary for certain knowledge of God's will. Uh, we have a sense of God's will that comes from an internal conscience that God has given to us, an internal sense of right and wrong, but our conscience uh, can lead us or mislead us, and we're not quite sure of uh, what God's will is. But when we have the Bible, it teaches us clearly and in words that we can read and understand what God's will is. Therefore, the Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel and for maintaining spiritual life and for certain knowledge of God's will. But we also have to say that the Bible is not necessary for knowing that God exists or for knowing something of his character. Um, Psalm 19, verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Or in Romans 1, Paul says, What can be known about God is plain to them. And it says that God has shown it to people through the things that have been made. And as far as God's moral law, Romans 2 says that the, the Gentiles, who do not have God's written law, they don't have the law of God in written form, when they do by nature what the law requires, they show that the law of God is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them. In other words, there is a conscience, a testimony of conscience, with some sense, not an absolutely certain sense, but some sense of moral right and wrong, and some internal sense that God exists. And most, some people deny that they have this, but the Bible says in general, it, it recognizes there are atheists, but it says in general, people have uh, a knowledge of, of God's existence and something of his moral character, and that's common to all people. It doesn't mean that they not have a knowledge of how to deal with their sin or their disobedience to God, but it, has, but it means they have a knowledge of what his moral standards are. 
Now, we can talk about general revelation and special revelation. The word general revelation is used to uh, talk about what people can know about God through observing nature and seeing God's influence in history and having this inner sense of God's existence that he's placed inside every person. General revelation is a great blessing for all of us in society because it prevents unchecked sin from running rampant and destroying everyone. People have a sense that God exists and that they're somehow accountable to him. It's just that they don't have an answer for how to deal with their sin. General revelation, revelation that God gives to all people generally through nature and an internal sense of right and wrong. But then there's special revelation. The phrase special revelation refers to God's words addressed to specific people, particularly the words of the Bible, but that would also include the words of the Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles when they were spoken, and the words of God in personal address that we spoke about in a previous section. The scripture nowhere indicates that people can know the gospel or know the way of salvation through general revelation. This is, um, a, a, it's a hard doctrine for us to think about at first when we encounter it because we naturally have a love for all others in the world. But this doctrine, I think, is necessary if we believe the teachings of scripture and it does give great motivation for evangelism and missions. In fact, this doctrine of the necessity of scripture has been the foundation and the motivation for mission work throughout the history of the church. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, so um, we really talked about the authority of the scripture. We talked about the clarity um, and the necessity. Um, of it and and that was very important because um it lets us know that even in this how important the prophetic is connected to the word of god like apart from the word of god you don't have the prophetic <laughs> you again again so we we i shared that because we're talking about false prophets uh people drawing their information from other sources and we're seeing here that apart from the word of God, there is no gospel. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? And um, and it's our life. It's our livelihood. Um, it's where we draw our moral character. It's where we draw who we are from. Um, the necessity of the knowledge of the gospel comes from it. Um, and faith. Uh, to be saved comes through hearing the word of God. So it's just saying, basically, this is our foundation. The word of God is the foundation for the prophetic. It's, and it's based off of our relationship. And as you were saying, I don't know if you heard that really clear about um, knowing the word of God, uh, reading the scripture, um, and talking about how when you read that word, the power of the word of God gets in your heart. It gets in your mind. Um, and, and he was saying, and as you, uh, as you get to reading that word, it speaks to you and it speaks to each and every last one of us. When we get in it, like he was saying, you know, when you hear the voice of the father. Um, all right. So let's, let's walk through this real quick. Um, if you got any questions, raise your hand. I might ask you, do you understand this? Um, we have talked about in the old Testament, uh, we are judged by our works in the new Testament. We are judged by Jesus works. So we talked about, um, the purpose of prophecy. We also talked about looking for treasure in dark places. Um, sin is not a secret to sinners. Treasure is a secret to sinners. Um, we talked about the call, call out the image of God in people. Um, so we talked about how the prophetic inside of every center is the image of God and that we can, um, we get to identify and call forth. So we talked about the importance of the prophetic. We talked about how prophecy calls people into destiny. Um, it just don't call out the future in one's life. It has the ability to transform uh, them into the person they were always meant to be. It also talked about um, the sensual parts of prophecy. Um, so we talked about how um, 
learning how the spirit realm works, how Paul taught the Corinthians, the church, uh, the Corinthian church on matters of the spirit realm, not just about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know if y'all remember that part. We talked about your first steps towards moving in your gifts. Um, we talked about pursuing that you should earnestly desire uh, your spiritual gifts by especially to prophesy. So we talked about expressing your desire for spiritual gifts by asking God. Um, we talked about the purposes of prophecy, how the gift of prophecy or the office of the prophet should never replace your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, we talked about prophecy convicts of original glory. So um, that uh, a prophecy to a sinner can reveal Christ in such a way that it reveals um, it reveal who Christ is uh, to that person. That's the mystery of the gospel. We talked about the three parts of a prophecy. We talked about revelation. What is God saying? Interpretation. What does it mean? Application. What do you want? Um, what do we do about the prophecy that we received? We talked about hearing God's voice and learning his language, which was one of the key things because he said my sheep hear my voice and a stranger will not follow me so we really talked about you got to know the voice of god learning the language of god um we talked about how god is multilingual he is not limited to speaking in one specific way so we talked about how god speak through he can speak through art he can speak through music he speak through people he speak through dreams he speak through um songs dance and so we just start talking about all the ways god speak learning god's voice is a process we learn to recognize god's voice through experience and having constant interaction with him so we're talking about learning god's voice is connected to again um being in relationship um and uh, again really tuning into like uh, I guess I want to ask all of you guys, and I, you can save it till later. Like, what is some of the ways God speak to you? Like, He speak to you in song. He speak to you through music. He speak to you through writing. He speak to you through um, uh, weather, nature. Um, so we can share some of those. Um, four different voices. We talked about that. We should not have uh, more faith in the devil's ability to deceive us than God's ability to lead us. So we don't want to be so devil conscious that we, the devil this, the devil that, the devil that. We should be preaching Christ Jesus more than we is talking about the devil. Uh, visions and dreams. We talked about that. We talked about trances and how God can speak to you through um, visions. He can speak to you through dreams, through trances being carried off in the spirit to where, you know, um, you having these different encounters in your dream, you wake up, it's something in reality. Um, we talked about that. We talked about how to judge and evaluate the prophetic words of God. Is everybody got revelation to all this stuff I'm saying to shake your head? Yes. Good, good, good. We talked about not quenching the spirit of God. Um, don't forbid the prophetic. Uh, we talk about not all prophecies are false prophecies. Not all prophets are false prophets. We talked about that. We talked about the heart and the source of where people draw it from is what makes them a false prophet. Um, we talked about discerning the spirit <laughs> by the, <laughs> discerning um, all these different spirits and evaluate the source of the word. We talked about that. Um, we talked about... Um, eat the meat and throw away the bones, examine, <laughs> it, evaluate characteristics of the prophetic word and what fruit it produces in your life. So we talked about that, looking at the fruit. Um, and then we talked about also receiving and ministering in the gift of prophecy. We talked about that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. We talked about impartation how we unlock the gifts of the spirit in our own lives by being around those who flow in the gifts. And remember we talked about that because remember he, um, in the beginning he told, I think it was Samuel, 
he told them to go down and he would run into a group of prophets and they would be prophesying. And when he came in contact with them, he started prophesying. Um, and we talked about you being able to operate according to the measure, the proportion of your faith. Um, do, 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 do. I think that's about it. So I want to open up um, for any questions. Uh, oh, we talked about self-control in the prophetic, managing, managing yourself when you receive a prophetic word. You have the ability to control and be responsible for your actions. So we talked about really having humility um, and learning how to control yourself when you get the word. Um, being subject to the prophet of the house. Um, doing stuff decent in order. And if you're in somebody's house or, you know, um, how do you share a word? Um, we talked about, um, all, uh, prophetic ministry should be redemptive. Um, everything should be pointing back to Christ. If it's, it should be pointing to Christ, leading to Christ. Um, it should never be leading to us. And do, 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 do. We talked about what kind of fruit are you your prophecies producing? And we talked about the false prophets. We talked about don't believe every spirit. We talked about uh, lawlessness and what lawlessness looked like. Um, we talked about how false prophets mishandled the word of God. We talked about the, the God told me. And how to keep practicing prophecy. And the last thing is always be ready. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Always be ready for the opportunity to prophesy. Um, so I, I always say if you stay in the word of God, you'll always be ready. And I used to teach my people at the bridge, like, y'all need to be ready. If you got to get ready, no, you don't want to get ready. You always want to be ready for anything, right? Somebody call you up in the middle of the night. If you've been in your word all day and you've been praying and worshiping, you're going to have a, you're going to have a word. Um, if, if I call you five o'clock in the morning and something doesn't happen, I'll be like, you got to preach in the morning and you ain't had nothing but an hour to prep. You still should have a word. <laughs> you should have a word. I'm not talking about being doctrinally sound to where you got to A, B, C and everything got to be all D. I'm talking, you should be able to give a, a, a prophetic word or uh, have a word of encouragement for um, the body, for the people, for the person that's calling you in the middle of the night. And this is why we got to stay ready, <laughs> like stay ready to prophesy, stay ready to be used of God. Always be ready, having a word in season and out of season. Um, and Teresa and them know this, y'all better not be talking about y'all ain't ready to preach like if I call you and say you're going to preach tomorrow, be ready. If I call you and say, I need you to do a funeral, be ready. If I call you and say, uh, I need you to go pray for this family, be ready. That's who we are. And, and, you know, and that's why the relationship, the intimacy, the time in the word, the time in prayer, the time before God is important because if when you're there, the water is, I mean, the flow is always there. Again, the, the prophetic flow is always there. We turn it off, but it's always there. Always be ready for the opportunity to prophesy. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. 2 Timothy 4 and 2. And lastly, start prophesying your day. We talked about this. This is the day which the Lord, the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Prophesy that your day will be in alignment with how God sees your day. So again, prophesy over your own self, lay your hands on your own self, prophesy over you, prophesy over your body, prophesy over your headache, prophesy over your knee ache, Pro lay hand, learn how to lay hands on yourself and prophesy, right? Um, we don't want to be like, um, I think it was Elijah. Elijah was so prophetic. He was so deep, but he was so deep that, I mean, you know, then when he, he fell sick with an illness and the Bible said he was so anointed 
that they threw bones, uh, uh, they threw the soldiers over into his graves and they was resurrected. <laughs> Somebody else going to be resurrected off of my bones, but I can't be resurrected off of, <laughs> off of my own anointing. So, um, and then lastly, we talk about practicing, practice giving words and knowledge. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to get it all right all the time, but we do not operate out of the spirit of fear. We are going to put into flame these gifts. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, the floor is open. If you got any questions, comments. None. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So this will conclude our last training on the basic training for the prophetic. In the back of your book, there is space for you to, if you dream or you have a vision, you can write it down. It's a space for interpretation and it's a space for application, right? Uh, so it did give you a lot of pages to write, uh, to put, you know, um, your dreams, your dreams and your visions down and um, your interpretation, your application. So other than that, I'm going to pray over you guys and I am going to release you tonight so we can get ready for the word of God. So, Father, tonight, I, I thank you for um, this prophetic activation tonight. I thank you, Lord. Uh, for the time that we have spent in your word, lear learning, uh, Lord, how to hear your voice, uh, how to tune in, uh, Father, to what you're saying and how to be connected through relationship, intimacy, uh, and Lord, being able to add application. So, Father, I thank you tonight for um, every person that was represented on this line, uh, those, Father, who have been connected to the class, but that... Um, uh, for some instance, is not here tonight. Um, Lord, I ask tonight, Lord, that um, as I pray over each and every person tonight, Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, that you would lay your hands upon their head, Father, and I pray that you would stir up every gift tonight, Lord. I pray that you would stir up, hallelujah, every dormant gift in the name of Jesus, Lord. Stir into flame, God, every gift, every purpose that you have uh, concerning them. And so, Father, tonight, I thank you, Lord, for divine activation. Uh, Lord, I pray tonight that you will give them clarity, uh, God, that uh, from this day forward, Lord, they will even see with greater clarity. I thank you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, you're going to give them uh, a greater hearing, uh, Lord, that they will be able to hear even clearer. And so, Father, I thank you tonight, Lord, that um, I pray that you would give them the ability to discern, Lord, um, to be able to discern things, Father, to be able to hear in the spirit and to be able to discern um, uh, atmospheres and those who are in their presence. Lord. So tonight, God, I pray uh, out of their obedience and out of their faithfulness and their commitment to learn more that, Lord, you will heighten uh, their spiritual gifts. And I pray, God, that you will... Um, you will grow them in the grace of God tonight. Father, we know that you give uh, by proportion according to their faith. So, Father, tonight, I pray that their faith has been increased in such a way, Lord, that no fear abounds. And so, Father, tonight, I pray, Lord, um, that you would just begin to expand the prophetic in their lives tonight, oh God. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them the boldness, hallelujah, to begin to declare your love, uh, your grace, your mercy, um, Lord, uh, everywhere they go, Lord, in such a way, Lord, that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be spread abroad. Hallelujah, Lord, and that we will see an advancement in the kingdom of God and in the body of Christ, Lord, because of the zeal, hallelujah, in their desire to pursue, uh, uh, to pro prophesy your word. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you will be edified. I pray, God, that you would be glorified, and I pray, Lord, that um, in all that we say and all that you do, Lord, your name, hallelujah, will be exalted in the earth. And in this, God, we give you glory and we give you honor, 
and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Guys, welcome to the amen. prophetic. Welcome to the prophetic life. Amen. Welcome to the prophetic Thank life. You, yes. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, we still have the prophetic group. Um, so I'm not going to dismantle that group for a while so that if you have dreams and visions or things that the Lord is sharing with you, share them in the group uh, so we can continue building a prophetic community. All right. All right. God bless you all. I love you. And again, thank you for allowing me to share with you um, and being teachable. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.